Welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the communist state of Illinois. This podcast, everything found on the website, unless otherwise noted, is covered by BitCon's No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more at BitCot.org. So I thought Kyle Reardon and I would uh, get together this week to record the next episode of our Building the Second Realm series, uh, as well as uh, another season three, uh, season 3 edition of the Vani podcast. But... That hasn't happened, unfortunately. Uh, now we're falling behind a little bit again, uh, it seems. And, uh, you know, it is out of my hands, so I sincerely apologize. But regardless, I have an extremely special guest joining me this evening on both this podcast and TVP. I've mentioned a book titled A Lodging of Wayfaring Men many, many times in the past month. Hopefully enough to get you to take some time to read the, read the damn book already. So if you took my advice, you're going to be glad you did. Today I'm joined by Paul Rosenberg, a longtime crypto anarchist and author of the aforementioned book. He also co-wrote a book called The New Age of Intelligence with Jonathan Logan, uh, both of which I highly recommend. I'll have him on today for about an hour to cover half of the things I wish to uh, talk with him about. And sometime in the very near future, I'll bring him on uh, uh, again to uh, cover the rest. So without further ado, Mr. Rosenberg, welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, sir. How are you doing on, on this uh, fine Wednesday evening? I'm doing well, and thanks for having me. Hey, not a problem, not a problem. So, um, you know, before I interview a, a, a new guest, uh, I always go back and listen to, uh, uh, go back and look at, you know, other podcasts they've been on. So I found you on Jake DeSilsa's podcast, a two-part episode, uh, back in, I think, 2012. And then I found you on uh, Anarchast, uh, I think, like, 2012 and 2013, you were on there a couple times. So, uh, I mean, did, have you done a lot more podcast interviews than that, or, or have I just, uh, you know, uh, you know have, have, I, have I not found them yet? Oh yeah, there there are more. I, I do podcasts. I do uh, radio sometimes. Um, uh, there are also uh, YouTube's out there somewhere of me speaking at conferences, things like that. Oh right, I did watch that. Uh, yeah, I watched one of your. Oh, I can't remember what the uh, presentation was called, but your daughter, uh, you know, introduced you. Um, oh right. Yeah, I don't remember which what what it was called, but it yeah, was that was from a, the, the Chicago Bitcoin meetup. It was on uh, cypherpunks and uh, Bitcoin. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's what it was. Yeah, that was a, a really fun presentation to watch. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> so I guess uh, to, uh, in this episode, Paul, I'd like to discuss the crypto anarchism, uh, anarchism aspects of uh, lodging of wayfaring men and obviously get your background and such for the listeners who may not be aware. Uh, but when we chat next time, I'd really like to dig into your views on spirituality and the Bible, uh, as well as your take on sexuality and, and modern marriage. Both subjects really discussed in this podcast, but uh, they were mentioned uh, and, you know, discussed at, uh, you know, quite a length uh, in your book, A Lodging of Wayfaring Men. And uh, I've never really seen a take uh, like yours before. So uh, we'll definitely dig into that, uh, you know, in the second episode. So I, I suppose we'll, we'll start here. Uh, I guess uh, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, how long have you been involved in the crypto anarchist community? And, uh, you know, how, how did you get involved? Oh, my. Um, OK, I'll begin with uh, I was in the electrical business uh, for many years. Um, I uh, wrote uh, the magazines for electrical contractors and electricians, sometimes for engineers. I uh, wrote the mag a lot of magazine articles, and I quickly got into fiber optics in the early 1990s because it was very interesting and it was the new area. And, I mean, it was brand new at that time. We literally made it up as we went, which was a gas. There, there was nobody telling us we what we had to do. I, I actually wrote the very first standard for the installation of optical fibers in buildings wow. because there was no one else to do it. And uh, so we had a guess with that. And I was always interested in computers and computer sorts of things. Uh, I was on bulletin board systems and then came the Internet um, and so I was I was involved with all sorts of things like that. And somehow by the middle 1990s, I was in the general orbit of the cypherpunk world. And just one thing led to another and I got involved with various cypherpunk projects and so on. So I've just been going in it for a long time. 
Awesome. That's 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 great to hear. And I did. I thought this was a mistake. I thought there was a second Paul Rosenberg out there because I, I searched Amazon to see if you've written anything else. And it was, yeah, a bunch of, you know, uh, I guess a bunch of guides. And I was like, hey, there must be a couple of Paul Rosenbergs, but I, I guess not. And it's actually kind of interesting. I just got a job as an industrial electrician's apprentice, uh, you know, uh, probably four months ago. So that's, uh, you know, I guess that, that kind of overlaps uh, very, very nicely here. So uh, I guess uh, uh, tell us a bit about your, your site, uh, Crypto Hippie. Oh, well, Crypto Hippie uh, is a professional privacy service. It's it's a VPN, but it's a professional level VPN. It's not really a hobbyist thing or, you know, you get your VPN for $2 a month uh, that they're all going for now. This is a serious VPN. And I'll tell you what, it actually came out of Lodging of Wayfaring Men. Uh, because after that book was published, it was anonymous at first. Uh, it was published first in late 2002, and I was hanging out on a particular uh, encrypted uh, anonymous chat hangout at the time, and people were talking about the book, which was very odd because I couldn't admit authorship. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very strange little position to find yourself in. It's like, hey, what, what and, do you think about this book? Um... <laughs> no, I think it's great. You know, am I being a shill? <laughs> but uh, one of the gentlemen there, uh, we talked a lot, and we had a lot in common, and we we had you know mutual feelings about things. And um, after he's a very bright guy, and after a while, he says to me one day on a private. Uh, channel. He says, you're the guy. And I said, what do you mean? He says, you wrote that book. And I said, um, well, what makes you think so? <laughs> and he had a very good uh, linguistic sort of analysis of why it was me. And I trusted him. So I said, yeah, it was. And he said, wow. uh, we need to talk. <laughs> and uh, yes, <laughs> I said, well, you know, where are you? And it's and he was in Germany, and I happened to be in Amsterdam at the time, and it was very um, it was very cinematic. You know, we met at the, at the at the cathedral in Cologne on a cold February morning, we're wearing trench coats, you know, and uh, but it really happened that way. And we met and we drove around for five days and talked about everything under the sun, and then the last day he said, you know what? meet me at the hotel bar once we get in. So I said, sure. And we sat at the bar and he quickly became very serious. And he said, look, and this is by the way, 2005. And he says, freedom has to exist somewhere. And I said, yeah, yes. And he said, right now, the internet is a great place for it, but it's being overrun with surveillance and all kinds of stuff. And we can't let it be lost. And I said, I entirely agree. And he said, I know how to do that. And I said, I, I know you do, because he's, he's very, very good at these things. And I said, I believe you do. And he says, I can't do it myself. I want you to do it with me. Well, what do you say? You have to say yes. Right. So I did. And that's really where Crypto Hippie began. It took us a couple of years to build our network. Uh, it, it you know required a, a special sort of corporate setup. It uh, it required uh, servers in lots of different countries. So it took us a few years to get everything really set up. And I think we started taking customers in 2007 or 2008. And uh, you know it's been it's been a lot of fun. I mean it's it's a nice company. Uh, it, you know, we, we make money out of it, but that's really not why we did it. We did it because it, it mattered. I had other things to do. So did he. And so did some of the other people in the company. But we decided it really needed to be done. No one was really doing it very well. And it was too important to let go. So that's what Crypto Hippie, how it began. Awesome, awesome. That, that's very interesting. In Germany, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, by that fact, uh, uh, I'm, I, I mentioned in a pre-show a website called Interplex.net, which uh, I came across a, a few months ago. Read all of the literature on there. That's actually where I found your book link the first time, and uh, mm -hmm. actually the, the only time. And uh, yeah, uh, it seems like uh, uh, a lot of those folks may be from Germany. In the book, uh, hashtag Agora is set in Germany. So I have a feeling there's a pretty good crypto anarchist community in uh, in that locale. Oh, there, there is. And it's really all throughout Eastern Europe, you find a lot of people. There's a, a conference I try to go to every year in Prague. Uh, it's called uh, the Hackers Congress at Parallel Polis. 
And um, wow, what a place to go. And you gotta remember the people from Eastern Europe, they not that long ago emerged from Soviet domination. So they have uh, kind of a feeling in their bones uh, of what of that surveillance and all this, mm. uh, all this stuff is really a bad thing. Uh, they have all the even the young ones. They have stories from their parents and grandparents that are very real to them, and uh, they're serious about this stuff. And there's a lot of good things happening in Eastern Europe. That's so great to hear. That's so great to hear. So, so I guess uh, uh, one question because I did recently something I've been meaning to do for a while. Uh, just, you know, haven't really gotten around to it. I, I have other means for this, but um, I decided that I would uh, I would subscribe to a VPN service. Now, I, I went with private Internet access um, to kind of test one out, honestly, is, is, was the purpose. And I used a gift card I got for Christmas to pay for the service. So, um, right. I mean, so so I, I guess something that, that came up when you were discussing your, your uh, crypto hippie uh, VPN service. I mean, what's the difference between like uh, private Internet access and what you what you guys offer? Well, I don't know that one particular. There's just so many now that I can't keep up. But I'll right, give well, you generally the, speaking, yeah. Yeah. The the usual difference is most VPNs are what we call a single hop proxy. Uh, very cool tech in the '90s. Not so cool anymore. Uh, it's just one hop. In other words, you connect to them, and then from there, they send you out into wherever, wherever you're to the internet from there. Uh, nothing wrong with it. It's fine. Uh, usually their front end connection is is uh, a fairly decent connection. Um, but for sort of surveillance purposes, it's really a, a slight bump in the road, if anything. What you need to do uh, is to have multiple hops, uh, two hops, three hops, uh, so that You've, we've all seen the, the silly uh, spy movies where there's a guy mm -hmm. tracking the signal. He's, he's in Aruba, Jim. No, he's in Cancun. No, he's in Madrid. That's what you need to do. Um, and so Crypto Hippie does that with two or three hops. Uh, another important thing is you should have your own key infrastructure. Uh, in the Snowden documents, uh, we found out that um, the NSA and their partners have pretty much infiltrated the uh, key uh, certificate agencies and got them to either weaken their weaken their hashes or or to give away uh, secrets to them. Uh, and they bragged that they had, oh, this was 2010 maybe, that they already had 30 VPNs and they were going for 300. Um, and the way they did it was to subvert, not to really subvert, uh, you can't, beat encryption. It, it just isn't done, not quality, well-implemented encryption, but you can trash the certificates. Uh, if you, these guys, they go into companies and they sit down and they have play good cop, bad cop and scare them and they get people to go along with them. After all, you don't want bad guys to blow up a bridge. Uh, so you have to run your own key infrastructure these days if you want to be a serious VPN. And uh, I, I really don't know anybody but us who does it. Uh, there, uh, there may be other people I just don't know, but I'm not aware of anyone but us who actually does that. Uh, another thing is you don't want to have a single point of failure. Uh, right. If somebody comes in and takes over your office, do they get everything that there is? Do they know everything about, every, about everybody? Well, we decided to uh, to not do that from the beginning. So Crypto Hippie is actually not one company. It's actually several. Uh, there's a network company, there's a sales company, uh, and they're completely separate uh, with non-identical ownership. And uh, so we do all kinds of things like that, uh, that, that make a real major difference. Like I say, there's nothing particularly bad about a single hop VPN. Uh, but the silly things are, you know, they're going to give them away. Here, we'll give you a free VPN. Well, you know, nothing's free. And if they're giving right. you a free VPN, then they're selling your information to other people, which is kind and of... <laughs> and it's slow as hell. That, I, I tried one of those three years back or something, and it was super, super slow. So I stopped using it uh, uh, really quickly. Well, I, I guess I, uh, you're, you're going to have another uh, another customer uh, here uh, in the next uh, week or so, I, I guess uh, private internet access may not be. I mean, it was just so easy. I, I use it on my phone all the time. When I'm not recording podcasts, I just set it up. But you can't really notice it's there, and you can it's you can connect, you can choose where you connect to. So I connect to Australia most of the time. Um, so I mean, it, it's 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 
it's convenient, and uh, I guess it's another uh, uh, another layer of protection, even though it may not be uh, may not be great. So, so, so speaking of encryption, um, I guess uh, uh, I just just real briefly here. Uh, so PGP, pretty good privacy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, is it uh, is it still uh, you know super secure? Uh, pretty pretty impossible to, uh, uh, to to crack. Yeah, pretty much. If you implement it properly, uh, PGP or uh, the open source version that pretty much everyone is using now called GPG or New PG. Right. Um, yeah, they're fine. The, the the difference in difficulty between encrypting and decrypting is something like two to the one hundredth power. So, you know, encryption properly implemented is really isn't going to be broken anytime soon. And people say, wait, but there's going to be quantum encryption. It's going to change everything. There's already quantum secure encryption that's been developed and uh, people are using it already. We'll be we are using it or are about to be using it in some of our some parts of our network. Uh, it's it's not the nightmare that people make it out to be, but it will be to people who don't stay current and people who don't update their systems and so on. Uh, then if, the, if they get quantum encryption, which is still not certain, uh, but if that happens, then a lot of things will be opened up to whoever wants to look, but not people who take it seriously. Right. All right. Very good. Very good. And yeah, that is, that is something that I've, uh, I guess, some sort of a uh... A reason or an excuse not to use PGP or encryption is, come on, you know the NSA can break that. Well, now guys, now you know that uh, if it's implemented properly, then uh, then yeah, it is. Uh, you're making it a, a major pain in their ass uh, if they ever want to look through your stuff, and uh, plus they probably can't even if they want to, uh, you know, according to Paul here. So uh, I guess let's go ahead and move forward here. Um, I want to thank you sincerely for taking the time to write a lodging of wayfaring men. Uh, the book was absolutely incredible. The characters had so much depth and the crypto anarchist themes throughout were honestly amazing uh, i was also quite surprised about your discussions on spirituality and the bible uh sexuality and marriage as well as your views on the overall human experience i was uh, quite pleased to see kind of that that analysis in your book and uh, uh i mean it was just it was pretty pretty uh, really really incredible man um so i guess just some background and i, I thought this was kind of funny but i first came across this book on a website called anarplex.net and uh, it was actually uh, it was written by an anonymous author. Uh, you know, come to find out a week or so later after a Google search, uh, you were actually the author. And uh, I, I first heard of you, uh, you know, via Ben Stone's books, Editions of Version and Sabotage. So I said, aha, I can reach out to Ben and see if he can put me in contact with Paul. So, uh, so, so, so here we are. Here we are. So, so I guess just the long story short, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to write this book. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for saying so. Not a problem, not a problem. So, so I guess tell us a bit about it. Uh, what made you write it? Uh, why did you originally publish it anonymously? And what caused you to put your name on it, uh, name to it later on? Okay, um, well, I was already an author. I had written, like, like you saw, a lot of uh, construction and engineering sorts of books. But I had all these ideas uh, in me. I had been reading history books and philosophy and all sorts of things forever. And uh, I just had some point where it just was in me and it was going to have to come out somehow or another. And uh, so I just began, I had never written any fiction before, uh, but I just began to do it. And I be, you know, began making my notes and, and uh, planning the story and so on. This would be sometime in the middle or middle 1990s, maybe 97, somewhere like that. And I, of course, I was involved with lots of uh, uh, cypherpunk sort of things, crypto anarchist sort of projects. So it was, you know, very up close and personal to me. So I know all of the issues involved. You know, people, you can, people see things in the movies. Oh, that's really interesting. That's kind of cool. But when it's you who's in that position, when it's you, you know, your butt's on the line then it's a very different set of feelings. And I think I was, I hope I was able to incorporate those in the book because I was actually living those things at the time, which made, I think for, I think it helped the book a lot. Um, so I finished it probably the first, I worked, worked, work, you know, in the afternoons and the evenings, whenever I had time, uh, whenever, you know, kind of it hit me that I needed to write more, I had a great idea. And I just worked on it over a period of years. And in about 2001, I really had a, a good draft done. And um, I sent it anonymously 
uh, to Andrea Rich of Laissez Faire Books, who didn't know me from Adam and was so nice and so gracious to me and read it for me and sent it back with comments that made the book better. Uh, I really owe her great thanks. Um, and so I incorporated uh, the things that she suggested and uh, went through it again and again and again. And in 2002, I was able to publish it. Uh, it actually was very, very anonymous. You know, it was mailed in a plain brown wrapper from Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, done through a, a very, very anonymous system that we had, an uh, economic system that we had at that time. Um, and the reason I did it anonymously was for, really, it was to keep my life from getting complicated and the life of my family from getting complicated. Uh, this was, remember, 9-11 uh, happened as I was doing my final editing. And two, mm. three weeks later, that, that awful Patriot Act came in. And I'm thinking, gee, this is a pretty radical book. I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't endorse violence or anything that, that you or I would actually say is bad. But, you know, the guys in the three-letter agencies in D.C. may find some reason to think I'm, I'm a monster. And uh, so I said, you know, I don't want my family to have to deal with that if that happens. I don't think the odds are very high, but there, you know, there, there are some. And I thought, I don't want them to have to deal with that. And uh, I think I'm just going to publish it anonymously. And so I did. Uh, and it went like that for several years. And then by 2007, I was really ready to uh, promote it better and to do other things. And it looked like the darkest uh, scenarios weren't going to come to pass. So I said, you know, all right, I'm just going to put my name on it and go from here and I'll play that role. And so I did. Awesome. Very good. Yeah, I can certainly understand your apprehension of, uh, you know, putting your name to that. So uh, obviously, yeah, as, as you said, you know, the, the, the risks were probably pretty low, but at the same time, uh, I mean, you, you really can't put anything past the state. Uh, you know, the, the scenario that you kind of laid out there, uh, you know, in the book and, and how much damage that did to the state, you know, I mean, that's, uh, you know, if that were to happen today, uh, yeah, it would be, uh, yeah, it would be a mess. They might not like you implanting that ideas, uh, impl implanting, implant, uh, implanting those ideas into people's heads. Not that the people reading that book already don't have those ideas, anyways. But, but I guess just mm -hmm. to, to to speak a little more to the book, I was, um, like there there's a book on Interplex called Hashtag Agora, which is incredible, incredible, sh sh much shorter read, much, uh, I guess. I mean, you're following you're following uh, two main characters throughout the entire story. But with yours, uh, as I said, there's so much depth to your characters, and you were following uh, and you're you're following like three or four different storylines throughout. I mean, you start out with George Demetrios, who was the uh, the right. scientist who was uh, he was uh, his research getting shut shut down by the uh, by intelligentsia by the by the uh, academia, and uh, he had some really revolutionary research that he was doing, and uh, he decided that he was going to steal all of his equipment and, uh, you know, move on to, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, do the research independently. Uh, you had, uh, uh, I think it was, was it uh, Michael, maybe? Michael or, I don't remember. Mike, uh, there's, there's a lot of characters, Mike, but the, uh, the the guy who was the proxy like, merchant, essentially, the the one that would, uh, you know, help people get new identities, uh, you know. Uh, oh, I guess, oh yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. so My the, British character. Yeah. Right, right. So, so, so there was that. And then there was just uh, uh, I'm a big fan of security culture. Uh, so just seeing all of the, seeing the ways that you implement that into your book. I mean, the developers, programmers, and maintainers of the free digital economy. Uh, as I said, they had proxy merchants. I mean, uh, uh, the the free souls. They uh, you mm -hmm. know went through was it James Farber who was uh, and and also Philip right. too for their finance years. Uh, and uh, they kind of uh, you know they were above board as far as uh, you know the state could see. They were just uh, you know. Uh, they were just uh, investors uh, following, following, you know, the letter of the law and all that, and uh, they helped keep the, uh, the the free souls operation going while they, you know, developed uh, the free digital economy. Um, there was, uh, oh, what else was there? The individuals uh, taking care of the uh, free digital economy's data centers uh, when they started okay. to, uh, you know, when the uh, the FBI started to, you know, figure out uh, and get worried about them. Uh, you know, they they're foreigners there that uh, had plausible deniability. They didn't really know what was going on. Uh, so they're able to when when these people would get 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 arrested, you know, they're able to get them off pretty quickly. That was a really interesting uh, way that she put that in there, and then also just the uh, terrific attorney on retainer uh, to handle all of these things. Uh, so, right. I mean, it was just really incredible to see how how this uh, I guess this spontaneous organization, at least to some extent, 
was able to keep themselves safe um, while doing this very contentious thing in the eyes of the, in the eyes of the state. Yeah, I thought that was a, a really important part because in real life you need to do things like that just for practical reasons. You want to keep yourselves safe while doing things that matter. Uh, and, and that's really a necessary part. And I, I, I thought it was important to, to really, and it, plus it made the story much more interesting rather than some you know character who just strides through on a white horse and makes everything happen. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, and 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 I think, um, you know, like there have been uh, you know deep web marketplaces like Silk Road, and and uh, at least with uh, with a couple I've I, I've uh, the couple that I've watched, uh, or I, I guess I've looked into, you know, why these people got arrested. It was basically just bad security culture. They 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 screwed up. Uh, they made a mistake, yes. and that's what you know got them caught. So I think uh, for people pursuing those, uh, I guess those definitely illegal or illicit, uh, you know, deep web marketplaces. Uh, for folks who, you know, hopefully in the very near future will implement the assassination politics that, uh, oh, uh, oh, I can't think of his name now. Uh, whoever, Jim Bell. Jim Bell, that's, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, when, when people decide to actually put that into action, uh, you know, they would be, uh, it would behoove them to read your book and, uh, you know, just see how all of these things came together because uh, obviously we don't want to see our people get tossed in cages. Definitely don't. Right. But I will, I will disagree with you on one thing. I don't think assassination politics is a good idea. Really? I think it's a, I think, I think, yeah, I think it's a very bad idea. Um, I don't know that it would actually work for one thing. For another, it would turn, you know, your average neighbors uh, against against uh, uh, people like us because it would scare them. Um, I mean, and plus the big thing is, I don't want our guys to be assassins. Killing people is really, really, really bad for you. Forget about the guy who dies. It, for you, it's a really bad, damaging thing to do. Most people never get away, get over it for life. So I, 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 I really very much think that's a bad idea. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I, I like to get uh, other viewpoints on that. I, I definitely do. We talked about it on this podcast before, and uh, uh, you know, I, I. I you know, I, I've liked the idea. Maybe I need to rethink that. Uh, I think you, you bring up some some, some some good points there. So um, I guess uh, uh, jumping forward again, have you ever heard of the, I guess, the concept of the second realm or second realm? Oh, sure. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I, I've read the book. I've read the book. It's it's terrific. OK, great. I, that's <laughs> that's that's, uh, you know, really, really awesome. So obviously there is some second realm stuff uh in uh, your book, Lodging of Wayfaring Men, uh, you know the Second Realm folks talk about proxy merchants. Uh, you know, to uh, people that would go from realm to realm, people that were highly specialized in their roles, uh, and you definitely right. in incorporated those uh, those into your book. And that was actually before before that book was written. I'm pretty sure. Uh, so, I yeah. guess how long have you been familiar with the concept of Second Realms? And and uh, we'll, we'll go with that. Oh my, um, I don't know when the Second Realm book was written. I want to guess 2012. 2013. I'm not sure. Somewhere, right. yeah, somewhere in that area. And I had had uh, discussions with people about that for well, quite some years before that. Okay. Very good. Very good. And then uh, also another concept of the second realm, which they took from Hakeem Bay, was temporary autonomous zones. Oh yeah. Uh, those were yeah. Those are definitely uh, definitely incorporated into your book. Uh, so so I guess overall, uh, as as far as the strategy for second realms and, and for the listeners' benefit, we haven't gotten to this part in the building the second realm series. But uh, you know, second realms can be can be either digital or physical. Maybe, maybe we've talked about that. I'm not sure. Uh, I guess uh, what are your thoughts on on second realms? Oh, I think they're necessary. Um, right now, we're we're living in a difficult condition. Uh, where we have these dominating groups that take everybody's money by force and and uh, lock people in cages from time to time if they don't do what they like. Uh, the, the real problem is that our neighbors and most people, they don't really think it's a, the greatest idea, but they, that's all they know and it's all they've got and they give it support. Uh, when they're afraid, they run to it because it's big. Um, so there are people, that's our real problems that people support it. Uh, but it's necessary in the current situation to have different ways to get away and get around and to slow them down. 
uh, you know, I we really don't do anything that anybody should really complain about. We don't hurt anybody. We're nice. We're nice to our neighbors, and we, you know, we're we're kind to animals and all of those things. We're, we're not bad people, uh, but at times we do need places that uh, we can meet and we can go to uh, that may be. Um, some of the enforcement class won't like and we need strategies to deal with it. So I think Second Realm is really important for everybody to understand whether you have to actually implement it or not is another question, but it's very important that you know it and you're able to implement it if you need to. Right, right. And uh, I, I guess one one thing they discuss pretty heavily in Second Realm book on strategy is culture. And this is something that I've kind of, I kind of overlooked for uh, I guess maybe the first couple years, uh, you know, when I when I found anarchism, and uh, I think it's something other than uh, I guess more of the folks in the right. They talk about culture all the damn time, but it's not, uh, you know, the the culture that the second realm folks talk about. Um, but right. but it's it's not just. Um, it's not just the state. Obviously, the state is this this horrible, violent entity that you know would be better off, you know, dead. But it's the culture too. If there was not a culture of statism, then there would be no state. There's be no state that could that could you know be maintained maintained in said culture. Uh, so, so the so the the culture absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, as you said, uh, you know, most folks, uh, you know, are, are very peaceful in their lives. They they avoid uh, avoid conflict because it just makes their lives easier. Um, yes. But uh, unfortunately, there's the third third party who they can outsource that that violence to, and uh, um, and yeah, it's unfortunate too. You know, speaking of second realms and, and kind of, I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with the concept of Vani, but uh, kind of radical lifestyles like van nomadism um, or you know, uh, off grid off grid living and such. I mean, that's demonized by a lot of folks in the in the in the mainstream culture, the first realm culture. Um, I yes. that's kind of my focus is in, in the Volney podcast, especially is looking at these alternative lifestyles and you know what people are doing and how you know we can implement those into our own lives and how to overcome some obstacles. And I've seen too many too many times when you know people wake up and their van will have you know a brick through the window, uh, or they'll have the blood they'll, or they'll call the bludgies on them. Um, so there's it's it's definitely the culture definitely has a, a pretty major impact on. Uh, you know, our lack of freedom today. Yeah, it, it really does. I mean, that's ultimately the answer is to change, to change what's in people's heads. And you know, it's this this thing about culture. It really is a big deal. Uh, and it, ha to be honest, uh, those of us we're talking about people, cypherpunks, crypto anarchists, agorists, whatever, like-minded people, libertarians. Um, we've kind of failed. Uh, in some ways, because most of us began as kind of, you know, very analytical types and we're very good at reading and writing and discussing ideas and thinking them and planning and 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 comparing this to that and this theory against that theory. Would be really a good idea if we did more music and art and things like that, because that speaks to a lot of people, too. It speaks to us as well. Um, and we, I think, had too much too much focus on the economic aspects and the legal aspects and the history of the philosophy of law and all of those sorts of things. And I think it would be a really good idea if we got more into singing and painting and sculpting and films and so on. Uh, I think that would probably be a good idea to kind of round out uh, the uh, for movement, I guess, for lack of a better word. Uh, but I think it's kind of important. I think we haven't done enough of that, and I'd like to see more of that come on in the next few years. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. And that provides a perfect segue into the next thing I want to talk about, uh, the oh, Free good. Souls. Uh, <laughs> now, they were an interesting bunch. Uh, they really were. I guess to provide some context to the listeners, uh, I guess a, a really easy way of putting it is they're free-spirited college-age adults. Uh, some of them are entrepreneurs. Uh, many of them helped uh, work on the development of the free digital economy. Uh, some helped with the uh, George Demetrios' uh, Breakers Science Project, which I'll, I'll have you talk about here briefly. Um, and it was just uh, an overall really, really awesome culture. I mean, whenever uh, I read the Second Realm book, whenever I, or I guess looking back on the Second Realm book, uh, the free souls kind of embodied what I imagined the second realm culture would be like. Um, you know, there was also, you know, Impressor John, I think that was uh, the, the, the pen name that... Uh, that uh, Philip went by, but uh, you know he would publish his anarchistic philosophical articles, and these young adults would just jump on it and have these extremely deep discussions, uh, you know, to help better understand the world, figure out, uh, I guess you know, go through the trivia method, uh, I suppose, and uh, 
you mentioned music. Uh, they're jam sessions. I think towards uh, the end of the book, they actually started up, uh, I guess, uh, you know, big theaters where, you know, you know, 100 people, you know, playing instruments. And I guess it was just a really beautiful thing. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely how I envision the culture uh, of the Second Realm. So I guess first off, um, before we before we got a little bit of a tangent here, but I mentioned it, uh, what was the, the Breaker Science project that uh, George Demetrios was working on? Well, that's actually a real thing that I hope some I, I would like somebody to put a lot of time and effort in. Um, what it is is there are these chemicals called neuropeptides, and when you have strong emotions, fear, whatever, fear being the big one, uh, but all of the, any strong emotion, these chemicals are released in your body and go through your body. So in effect, they're transferring the fear. It's not just in your mind; it goes all through your body. And these little, they're little chains of, of protein-like molecules. And the thing is, all of our cells in our body, human bodies, is the cells are immensely complex. And they have uh, little spots where they attach to our cells, receptors. And these things go there, and the fear actually affects your individual cells in your body through these neuropeptides. Well, in the book, uh, George Demetrius uh, comes up with a way of breaking these things when they get stuck in receptors and thereby eliminating a whole, eliminating a whole host of psychological problems. Um, this is real research. Uh, it has, it, a lot of this has been done. Uh, one of the leading figures in it was a lady named Candace Pert, who was on the team that uh, uh, identified the opium receptor. Uh, and uh, this is real stuff. Um, the breakers, the ability to, to break these chemicals uh, so that they fall out of their receptors and they're essentially cleansing the, the history of bad emotions from us. Uh, that has not been done yet so far as I know. Uh, there is every reason to think that it's possible. And I, of course, think it would be a really good idea for somebody to do. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. I uh, I guess another thing I really didn't think about too much. Uh, and again, sorry, it's a little bit of a tangent, but uh, it, I I, met, I brought it up, and it was something the free the free uh, uh, the free souls uh, worked on. But <clears throat> for the first couple of years of being an anarchist, I mean, I was definitely the uh, uh, I spent a year studying the philosophy and the economics, and I thought just the emotional like emotion aspect, the uh, you know kind of the individual things like uh, psychotherapy and uh, you know spirituality. I kind of uh, shunned those things. But mm -hmm. upon further thought, if people are going to be you know, building second realms. Uh, it would be a very wise idea for, you know, them, you know, me included, uh, to, uh, I guess, uh, get rid of, uh, you know, whether it be the collectivist spooks, the controlled schizophrenia, um, the... Uh, you know the the damage that uh, you know this. I mean, uh, along with the uh, along with the culture uh, of the first realm, uh, it's a very degrading culture. Right. Uh, it really is. So uh, to kind of uh, you know uh, I guess uh, uh, get those things out uh, before starting second realms and such. So uh, yeah, I think the the uh, the that uh, what you're talking about the the breakers idea uh, would would definitely be a, a terrific thing. So. Um, I guess uh, uh, back to the free souls here. Um, now, I, I know this, the answer to this question from your guest appearance on Jake DeSilva's podcast, but I thought it was a really, uh, really interesting story. And it just uh, uh, <laughs> definitely, you know, leads me to further believe that you had a very interesting life. Uh, so does that group resemble any part of your personal experience? Yeah, it does. It re resembles several different parts. Which story did I tell Jake? I don't remember which one it was. Oh, man, it was... Um, Oh, I don't remember word for word, but uh, you had a group of people that you hung out with that, uh, you know, it was, it was like that essentially what I gathered out of it. Oh, yeah. Back in the 70s, I had I had groups of people that I hung out with that were very much like that. Um, and it was a gas. I mean, it was just wonderful. Uh, people would come over. Hey, I'm, we're coming over. We're going to bring the guitars. OK, well, why don't you tell so and so to come over, and bring their guitars, too? OK, yeah, well, I'll get my wife to to, to make up, uh, you know, a you know, a tray of something. Okay, uh, we'll send Bobby out to the store to get a bunch of stuff to drink, and let's go. And we just we would just do that all the time, and it was a gas. And uh, it's it's really a very special type of thing, uh, really kind of moving and memorable experiences. 
And uh, it's it's something I, I think people should do more. And it, I know it's hard sometimes. We're all busy. We all have things going on, especially if you have families. But it can be done. I mean, we did it, and we were we weren't a race of supermen. We were just guys, and uh, we did it. And it's 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 a wonderful way to do things. Uh, and I really <laughs> recommend that people try to do it as much as they can. Oh yeah, I I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree for. Um, I just, I moved an hour south for this uh, for this uh, for this uh, industrial electrician's job, and uh, I had to get rid of my drum set because I couldn't bring it where I'm where I'm living now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, whenever I'd have uh, you know friends over and we'd sit there and jam for you know hours, uh, there was nothing better than that. Uh, nothing better than that. So uh, I, I definitely get where you're coming from too. And uh, yeah, to speak to the culture wonderful. of, of no matter how much, no matter how good the recording and how good the stereo system, when you're sitting in a room making music with your friends, it's a, it's it's on a completely different order. It, it's just much better. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I I definitely agree. I definitely agree. But you know that that culture of the uh, of the free souls. Uh, uh, you know, in that second round book, they talked about it. And and if you consider uh, you know, people in second realms where their autonomy is respected, where, uh, you know, it's unhampered creativity, unhampered uh, innovation. Uh, you know, I I can't even imagine. Uh, I mean, I, I sound old when I say this. I've said it in other podcasts before, but, you know, mainstream music, just the mainstream culture, you know, kind of the artistic side just sucks. It really it, does. It, it so, really does. <laughs> We got lucky in in the in the 70s, in the late 60s, early 70s. Things kind of broke apart, and no one was sure how things were going to go. And a new model was coming along, and everything was in the state of flux. And in that kind of condition, people get to do things that they wouldn't normally ever get to do. Um, take a band like the Moody Blues. Uh, their first album that anybody paid attention to began by some record company just trying to say, well, gee, we don't know what to do. We got this new stereo thing. We got this group. They got an interesting sound with this organ thing they've got now. Uh, maybe we can get to do a Dvorak symphony. Huh. Okay. <laughs> and one by one, it uh, piece by piece, it just turned into something else. But you'd never be able to get away with that today. And that album was a wonderful album, and it made uh, the Moody Blues... Uh, I, well, I thought they were a terrific band. A lot of people did. And it just put them on the map. And you couldn't do that today. I, I heard somebody say the other day that there was a, some new pop, pop song uh, for some famous artist that had five writers and eight producers. Okay, That's not art. That's, that's right. corporate product. And there's a big, big difference. I would rather hear the mistakes in the music. I mean, no, no musician wants to make mistakes, but it does occasionally happen. Um, I would rather hear that and have it be real and people really caring about what they're singing and playing than have it, you know, absolutely perfect and corrected 15 different ways. It's, it's just there, there's no soul in it. It's just, you know, a noise box. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. And uh, thankfully, I found uh, metal. I'm a metalhead. Found that, uh, you know, three <laughs> or four years back. And uh, that's very much, you know, counterculture in the sense that everyone hates it except for metalheads. And we're a very, very small minority. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, it, it's very, very difficult music. It's very fast music. And, mm. uh, you know, the, the lyrics, too. I mean, these people sit down and write their own lyrics. Oh, my gosh, who would have thought that people would do that? Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, I guess there's a lot of bands I listen to. Most of the bands I listen to, uh, you know, it's very much, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, freedom oriented. So you can still kind of find, uh, it's called politicore is the, the subgenre of metal. So, uh, so yeah, in a, in a second realm, I can't even imagine what, uh, what, the, what the culture would be like. It, it's, it's really hard to imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I, it would be, it would be very, I would really like to see what it was. What I what I really found interesting about you know, lodging of wayfaring men was uh, when Philip started writing articles, uh, and kind of, you, you kind of saw you saw some of that during the the, the main course of the book, and then at the end uh, there were uh, I guess very art very various articles and essays um, by uh, um, by. Uh, was it uh, James, uh, well, James or Philip, one of the two, and then there was uh, one by the uh, by James's uh, woman. I don't remember what her name is off the top of my head, but Francis, um, yeah. Francis, Francis Marsden. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, but these are these articles. I mean, 
<laughs> just great, great stuff. So, so I guess the question that I have is uh, – a lot of fictional authors draw from their own personal experiences. They draw from people that they know that uh, you know they want to work into the book. Maybe it's conscious, subconscious. But um, do you see yourself in this uh, in this book at all? A book at all? I know that's a personal question. But I'm just curious, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to. No, it's okay. Yeah, I, I think I think I do. Yeah, um, I kind of see myself uh, to some large extent in all of the. All of the primary characters, I suppose, all at least the primary male characters uh, that I write, I definitely see part of myself in Philip. Um, his life arc and mine are very similar. Um, a little bit, I see myself in Farber. Uh, in a, other books uh, that I've written, a new one uh, that, that I've written, I, I see myself in the main character, Fairmount. I don't want to make them me, uh, but I want to write their interior life. And necessarily, that pretty much comes out of me one way or another. So there's definitely, uh, definitely similarities. Although I don't want to, I don't want to make them me. Right, right. And, and what's the is, is your new book out already? Yeah, it's called The Breaking Dawn. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry, I didn't know that was out. Uh, so I, I guess just a, a, a quick digression. What, what what's that about, and uh, where, where can I get it? Oh my! Um, well, first of all, the easy part you can get it on Amazon, uh, paper or Kindle. Um, what's it about? Wow! It, it's like Wayfaring Men, but longer and larger in scope, and and not um, focused only on computer sort of things. It, it begins in the very near future, uh, where uh, the society is essentially um, driven in two. Uh, and one group of people are um, more or less left to their own, uh, harassed and everything, but still left to their own. And the other becomes more and more uh, of the world of um, the new age of intelligence. Have, have you had a chance to read that one yet? Yes, yes, I have. Yeah. Yes, at Ben okay. Stone's recommendation, yeah. That, that's one stream of it. And the other is a stream that you and I would like very much, but it's very, um, it's, it's less high tech and more, um, I mean, there are blockchains in it and things like that, uh, but it's it's broader. Uh, it's it's everybody, and it shows how these two different strains uh, develop each in their own way, how they separate, and and the conflict that they have at the at the end, and then it really gets interesting because it goes 100, 200 years in the future, and the changeover event. I won't explain, but it's. A surprise and it was a hell of a surprise to me I didn't have it planned when I started writing the book and when I realized what was going to happen I was oh my god is that really that's that's it that's what's going to happen that's going to be the moment I didn't know what I was going to write but I do now oh my so wow yeah so it's a, I, I mean I think it's awesome but then again you know I wrote it so I, you'd hope I would I would love it <laughs> right. Well, I'm, if it's uh, you know, if it's written as high, is it, if it's as high quality as *The Lodging Away Frank Men*, uh, you know, I I I, I know it's a, a fantastic book. So um, I guess uh, to, to to kind of close out this portion, I've got a couple other I guess conclusionary questions. But uh, the listeners should clearly see that uh, how how important this book is for for anarchists, both philosophically. Um, we talked about the, the the philosophy and kind of the culture aspect of it, but also direct action oriented too. Uh, it's uh, a very very important book. And uh, what I'll do is um, I will uh, um, post the, uh, the the free link to the Anarplex one, and then I will also put uh, the Amazon one in there. If you want to support Paul, I I really really recommend you do. Uh, and I think after reading it, you'll uh, you'll definitely. Uh, you know, be be happy with uh, be, be happy with uh, the support. So, um, I guess just a couple of conclusionary questions here. What what are your thoughts on Bitcoin and uh, other digital currencies? Uh, are you pleased with uh, the development of the crypto anarchist realm in the past ten years or so? Oh my yes, uh, I, I love I love Bitcoin. I love the cryptos. Uh, you know, there's little complaints here or there. They should have done this. They should have done that. The block size, blah blah blah. Whatever. It's here. It's real. People are using it. Uh, it's it's wonderful. I'm as thrilled as I can be uh, with with cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, there's problems, but there's always problems in life. Um, so I'm I'm thrilled with that. I think it has a tremendous future. I think it's made it through the hardest parts. Even this current uh, 
problem, this problem, this current situation where, you know, all of a sudden the price tanked um, or the exchange rate to be proper about it. Uh, honestly, I think it was necessary because it cleared out all of the crazy scam artists and we're going to get you rich next week. You know, give me $5,000. You're going to be rich, rich, rich. Um, you're going to buy a Lamborghini next year. You know, <laughs> those kinds of things. They've been cleared mm -hmm. out now, or at least pretty well cleared out. And uh, I, I think that as painful as it was, I think it was pretty much necessary. And now we can go back to work. Um, so I'm really, really, uh, I, I want to see them do very well. And I have my my complaints about things and are like this currency better than that currency and those sorts of things, just like everybody else. But the fact that these things exist, that they're getting around, that there are, I don't know what the real number is, I, I'm going to guess 100,000 people who get up every day and want to build something awesome in a decentralized economy. My God, what a development that is. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, I wouldn't dare dream of such a thing, and here it is. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just thrilled with it. Oh yeah, yeah, and even the even the folks who uh, who weren't really anarchist or libertarian or even liber libertarian leaning before, uh, you know, they learn about this decentralized technology, and now they're a fan. Now, now, uh, you know, some folks may be in favor of decentralization, which is contrary to probably what the what their uh, what their positions were before. So, I mean, it, it's it's great for a whole slew of reasons. Yeah. Uh, now, I guess the the other question: How crucial do you see? I mean, it's not just uh, you know uh, currencies that's that's being developed. Uh, you know, on the backs of Bitcoin and, and, and these other ones. I mean, there's there's blockchain technology here, too, that can do a lot of really incredible things. I've said many times before that blockchain technology is will be the infrastructure for the second realm. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm still obviously uh, believe in that. So I guess the question to you, for you is how crucial do you see blockchain technology uh, being in the pursuance of personal freedom? Oh, I think it's a really important tool. Um the, the interesting thing about blockchains, and again, who knows what, what all the applications are going to be. We're still at the early in the early days of this stuff. It's still a new idea where, where even the people who are, have, are its advocates are still wrapping their minds around what this thing is. And mm -hmm. what it is, is blockchain is a, is a tool for scaling trust and in a decentralized way. So you don't need some boss man sitting in, in the big office in the big building deciding who can be trusted by whom. The system creates that and can scale it indefinitely without a central controller. I, I'm not even sure all the places that could be that could be applied. And one of the other things that it does, and I was just working on this idea recently, is there's a, a thing called Dunbar's number. And it just means that humans uh, have a difficult time cooperating uh, really well, uh, more than about 150 people. Well, blockchain right. scales trust to any number of people. So it's a way around Dunbar's number. It's not perfectly around it. It, it's, it has certain limitations. It doesn't do everything, but it's a big, big piece. So I, I'm really not sure how far it can go. I'll bet you in the next five, 10 years, there are going to be applications of blockchain that none of us imagined. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a really, really you know great time to uh, to be an anarchist. Actually, uh, it, it really is. I I, I mean, um, I've been very harsh, um, you know, on uh, you know the the political crusaders, and that's uh, yeah. you know that's uh, and, and and you know when I when I tell people a lot of this stuff, uh, or at least some folks, you know, it can be kind of depressing. Like, there's no hope in politics. I mean, you you have to find out find freedom right. for yourself. <laughs> but when you Look at all of the possibilities. I mean, here on Liberty Under Attack, we have the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action, which is a an economic free uh, or a, a value free directory of the economic means solutions. There are about a hundred of them. We came out with that uh, late 2015 and 2016. We did the Direct Action series where we examined uh, you know individual aspects of the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action, and then uh, also the other podcast to do the Vani podcast is all about lifestyle changes to uh, make yourself more invulnerable to coercion. Uh, so, and I say all that to say that. The outlook for personal freedom has never looked better, and technology, crypto anarchism, is the major driver, in my opinion. Um, it's decentralizing thing. It's given. It's it's you know the, you mentioned all the the decentralized trust aspect. Um, it's doing so much that you know 15 years ago, uh, you know no one really could have uh, could have really imagined where where this was going to go, and we can't really we can't really imagine where it's going to go in the next 10 years too. It's a very very new technology. 
Oh, yeah, you're you're entirely correct. Uh, and the, the, the future is looking very, very bright. Yeah, there are some big problems. Of course there are. Uh, but the systems that are making trouble and have immense power right now are really far more fragile than we think they are. And a few changes, a little bit here, a little bit there, and they're not the monsters that we think they are anymore. Um, yeah, if they come down on you now, they, I mean, they, they kill, they can kill you, literally. Um, but the ideas in millions of human minds are changing, and it takes time for that to change everything else, but it does invariably. So, boy, if you ever wanted a good time to start talking to, to friends and neighbors, uh, this, this is it. Uh, make sure you 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 speak with kindness. You speak with love. You do it so you can help them, not convert them. Uh, but boy, this yes. is, this is a great time to start talking to people because things are starting to move. Right, right. And I actually did see uh, it's one of the one of the groups I'm in. Uh, there was this uh, this graph of you know like uh, the adoption of technology. And uh, like obviously you had like uh, you had the car. You had uh, you know just these different technologies. You had the internet. And the adoption rates, like if you compare the uh, when these things, be, you know, were entered every single household, uh, cryptocurrencies or digital currencies are still super, super low. Like if it's uh, if going on the uh, on the vertical axes, you know, the top's 100 percent. Most of those are like 95 percent and, and uh, cryptocurrencies are down maybe at like uh, five to 10 percent. So uh, we ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> yeah, no, we're 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 in a in a really good position right now uh things have things have started to change and gosh this is this is the time to really be serious about it and to i hate to say things this way because people will take them the wrong way but uh, i'll just say it anyway this is we got a shot to bless the world and, and i mean that in a very real way uh i don't mean that to be trite i say people you know if you want to help the world get better love love other people and i really truly mean that now people sometimes think i'm being trite or repeating slogans or something but god if we do that we, we have the information now that we know what we're talking about we understand how humans can live more healthy and and rewarding lives we need to start telling people we got the answer in our hands yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. So yeah, in short, I mean, it's a it's a great time to uh, to be be alive despite uh, uh, despite all of the uh, terrible things the state is doing and will continue to do. Right. Um, but uh, but anyways, I guess uh, we're we're coming up on an hour now. Uh, so so I guess uh, any closing thoughts for the listeners? Oh gosh, um, well the the things I always say: live your life. Don't be intimidated by anybody else. Um, learn uh, to trust yourself, learn to develop yourself, live your own life. Uh, uh, again, love people. I mean, seriously, work on really loving other people. It's harder than you think. It's a lot easier to argue uh, about, you know, intellectual matters. It's a lot harder to actually love other people. But if you want to change the world, that's what's actually going to do it. Indeed, indeed. And uh, why, uh, why don't you go ahead and plug whatever you want to, uh, uh, Crypto Hippie, uh, uh, or anything else? Would you like oh, to sure. listeners? My, my newsletter, it's freemansperspective.com, just the way it sounds. And we have free articles and a monthly newsletter, which is, uh, well, I think it's awesome. But it's, you know, we have monthly articles on history, philosophy, everything. Right, right. And uh, uh, from listening to one of your uh, other interviews, and, and I think this was actually, as I, I did hear on Jake DeSillis' podcast, you were writing a new book, but it wasn't done yet. I guess I kind of forgot about it. But um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, it uh, seems like you've got a wealth of knowledge on history as well, so I might have to get you back on and talk about that uh, that specifically. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm extremely looking forward to having you on again to talk about uh, uh, you know spirituality in the Bible, because your take is very, very interesting. Uh, and then also uh, kind of the, uh, the, the, I guess, the uh, just just modern marriage. I've had my own I've had my own kind of concerns with it, and um, I mean it's uh, uh, it'll definitely be a, a great discussion there. So um, Paul, thank you so much for for coming on Liberty Under Attack, and uh, we'll definitely get you back on here again. My pleasure. Thank you. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with with these you know 
ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone, again libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. Libertyunderattack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story, find your freedom. the second volume in the Brushfire thriller series, takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the war of ideas took place. The creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished for the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been band nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They're up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the TRIO, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the TRIO pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire Bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Libertyunderattack Publications, share your story, find your freedom.